welcome to another Round the Rotary podcast. Uh, thank you for everyone for tuning in. Uh, we hope everyone's doing all right out there. And uh, before we begin, we got to do the, the, the regular Round the Rotary podcast is brought to you by Capital Patron Consultants. CPC specializes in project engineering, well site supervision, and all disciplines of the oil and gas industry. Contact us through www.capitalpatronconsultants.com to see what CPC can do for you today. Was that good? That was super good. Thank Better you. than the. Uh, DRWs. Oh yeah, slightly. Well, I was a little more. I, I was. I, it was <laughs> first off, it was Zoom. You don't have the face-to-face thing. For for those of you that are listening right now, uh, with us in the studio, we have uh, Andrew uh, Coronado, the U.S. Account Manager for Dare Corporation. Did I get all that right? Got it all right. All right. Versus, unlike the first time we met, we were sitting there at lunch for about an hour and a half, two hours. I'm like, all right, Anthony, see you later. Yeah. Which was a it was, it was a brain fart. You know, people oh. have to do that. It's it's COVID. Well, uh, I'll tell you right now, the weirdest thing was getting the invite and seeing podcasts with Anthony Coronado. Dude, I know, I feel so. And uh, I don't know that guy. No, it wasn't. The, that wasn't. The, that was the the lunch invite, not the uh, podcast invite. I got it right after the, the second time. I don't know. I might have to get my phone. Okay, we don't have to do that now. We don't have time right now. We're going live right now. And uh, so anyway, but anyone, everyone, thank you uh, for joining us again. Um, we're hoping that you're enjoying this, and uh, we're going to get this kicked off like we normally do. Andrew, thanks for joining us in the. Uh, in the studio today. Is this your uh, is this your first podcast? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Professional or personal? And you're excited about it? Oh yeah. Yeah. Super excited. Well, I'm glad you decided to come on in because I, I we you and I met recently, and I, I think that uh, just kind of uh, just talking to you and, and hearing your story and just kind of uh, you know shooting the shit back and forth, I think uh, I you know wanted you to come on to kind of uh, or uh, to just kind of just shoot the shit with me, talk about you, talk about uh, Dare Corporation, talk about. Kind of just kind of what we do or normally do, you know. Sure, just, let's sure. move around the rotary. Cool. So, why don't you give us a little background, bud? Why don't you tell us the kind of uh, where you, where you grew up, kind of how you got in the oil field? Keep it long and short as you want, bud. Yeah. Uh, so, born in San Antonio, moved around mainly just all over South Texas. You know, Corpus. Started kindergarten in Houston. Quickly moved back to Corpus, and then uh, finished out high school in Kerrville. So, okay. just a small town out in northwest of San Antonio. I know Kerrville. And uh, yeah, then went to the University of North Texas for music, which is super ironic being in oil and gas for no, 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 starters, no, no. right? No, tell me, t- <laughs> music. Well, tell me about that. So my dad uh, grew up as a drummer. My mom is a singer. On okay. My third birthday, I got a set of drums, and I mean, it's just kind of like as a kid, they make a lot of noise. It's super oh, yeah. interactive, right? It's just it's what you do. Yeah, like, I got you're, it. You're, you're gonna play with that stuff for a while. It's just a big toy. My wife, I got it. Uh, or, uh, daughter uh drum set on her Christmas when she was five so okay. yeah I, I get the whole making noise thing yeah, I get it, yeah. Uh, and come to find out I mean I was pretty um you know ambidextrous very coordinated and that whole thing and stuff as far as just like just the art of being able to play stuff and the skill just kind of came natural to really me. that was really weird because you know I, I throw left I bat left I kick left but then I'll, I'll how about this I shoot rifles left, but I shoot pistols right. What? And so there's this big split. And, and so obviously when you're drumming, you have to be able to use all four of your limbs simultaneously and all that stuff, right? So it was just super easy for me uh, at that point. And it was cool. And obviously having a fascination for music, it just kind of clicked. Yeah. I, I'm blown away. First off, the whole percussion, the whole like, you know, pat your stomach, rub your head thing. Like, I've never mastered that. I can't imagine like, <laughs> Using both my arms and both my legs to, to to keep a beat to keep the rhythm going. My wife's a musician and like it's one of those things. I just walk back from let let her do her thing because I don't want to step to the plate. Yeah, uh, you know, in high school, I I thought about kind of I think that you know sophomore year I started thinking, okay, what am I going to do with my life? And there's obviously this like big expectancy for everybody to start asking me that stuff and right. family members. So trying to figure that. Out. I remember watching this movie and this guy was um, a structural engineer and he design roller coasters and so I immediately pivoted to that because it sounded super cool and I remember a few people saying man if you're if you have this you know perceived gift and you know, this is what you've been doing it's almost like a, a sin to not pursue that and so it just kind of made sense to try that and I ended up you know going to the University of North Texas which is the largest music school in the country it's extremely uh, big in the music of, um, so and, and especially what, 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 the drum what, side. Well, what was your goal? What was your? I just want to be a rock star. <laughs> really? Oh yeah. So the guy that got me in, which is crazy, is this guy by the name of Greg Bissonette. And whenever David Lee Roth separated from Van Halen, yeah. Greg Bissonette was his drummer. Yeah. 
It was like, the, and he went to North Texas, and he's Diamond from Detroit. Dave. It, yeah, uh, yeah. So he was Diamond Dave's drummer when he separated when from he his yep. solo career. Yep, yep. And so, in this guy's play, we you know everybody from Santana to I mean, any really, oh yeah, like throughout the nineties. I mean, this extremely skilled guy. And I remember uh, he was a guest uh, for this percussion concert, like my senior year. And North Texas wasn't even a thought at that point. Right. I wanted to go out to Los Angeles, uh, to Cal State Northridge, yeah. and study under him. And so the like director at that time just brought this guy over as like a clinician, and th that way I have somebody to you know, talk to or just you know kind of keep in contact with. And he goes, "Man, you need to go to North Texas. You know, like, I went to North Texas. You need to go. Okay. It, it's like it's the school." Okay. And he goes. Do you want to go to North Texas? Like, tell me right now. And I remember, like, everybody, he said it in front of 25 oh, people, like all my peers. On the you spot. Know? And I was like, of course I want to go to North Texas. What are you talking about? And so he made a call to the percussion coordinator. And uh, auditions are already ended. I mean, this was like late April, your senior year. I mean, it's, oh, it's yeah. Done. And uh, he said, hey, just got off the phone, send in a tape, like, follow kind of like what you need to do to get in as you would be applying in February or, you know, before. And so I did it, and the craziest thing was opening my Hotmail account, Hot. like, like, yeah, like 10 days, nice. 10 days after I submitted, and getting this formal, you know, congratulations, you've been formally accepted into the University of North Texas School of Music. It was like the craziest, most surreal thing. And, and then I went, and it was just really, really cool. And I, it was, I don't know, it was, it was an interesting journey. Well, what's that, that what's, what's that experience like going to music school? I mean, because, or going to school for music. I mean, you studying the history of music, you studying technique, you studying what? Yeah, right? like, a, it's kind of like, the, there's this whole, uh, just this whole, like, basic principle of that. And then you have your emphasis. Mom was obviously drums. Uh, Greg Business and it went as uh, music education. That way, if something would have fell through, he could still teach. Right. So I kind of kept that as well. Okay. And uh, but me, I wanted to be as as well rounded as possible. And so, what my, bands were you in? So that's everybody asked me that question. I really wasn't in. You know, going for, to like a it was an extremely big jazz like, university. Okay. So not a whole lot of like you know oh like I was in a rock band or this you know I mean you could be but. Predominantly, all the guys there were just studying like, jazz. It's like traditional, like bebop jazz. So, was that bebop? Yeah, that's that's the bebop one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and uh, yeah, so it was the first. So the did, you, first, did you fit in there? I mean, I mean, what, oh yeah, did, yeah, yeah, did you like sure. the whole? Did you, were you a jazz percussionist, or were you like what would you would you uh, practice? So I think I conformed to that because I grew up playing a lot of rock yeah. and and stuff like that. And just in. Kind of off what, the what, jazz what, what drummer did you look up to uh, growing up in what band? Oh man, uh, without a doubt, through high school, um, Dave Matthews drummer Carter Beaufort. Okay. Without it, like I just wanted to be. Okay. You know, I just want to play like him. I remember listening to just live at this live at Red Rocks. I mean, I listen, yeah. you know, or uh, live at the Gorge, and obviously, in you know, before this was it something crowded streets. That was it, like his biggest album. But I remember just listening to it, listening to it, listening to it, listening to it. But I was also had kind of this fascination for other genres and okay. stuff like that. So it was it was really interesting. Now looking back on it, um, I don't know if I would do it again. I because I realize how many things in my life I said if I look back on that I would do it again. <laughs> I mean, that's, you can't look. I don't think you can look at life that. I mean, yeah, it, I mean, it, was, it was an experience. It was kind of crazy because every day uh, I started really realizing. Over the, the those three you know three and a half years that I was there, yeah. that I started focusing less on the curriculum, which is kind of an easy way to say I just wasn't as interested right. in the actual curriculum, and started focusing more on, I just want to play music. I'd stay in a practice room for hours, really? you know. But there were guys that there they would, I mean, they're like, hey, that guy like he practices five hours a day. Hey, that guy, and these are like top players, like dude, like. That's kind of the yeah. thing. I mean, you got to be absolutely obsessed, and I was, um, but I really, like, truly didn't. Look, I know now I didn't want to do that long term. I just thought I'm gonna just be a rock star. Right. And it's funny that you mentioned David Lee Roth because I saw him like three years after I got out, and man, he looked pretty aged out and partied up, right? I mean, and I thought to myself, man, like, what 
well, what about like you're supposed to have a family and you're supposed to you know kind of do all these other things and so pretty much uh, the, the whole society standard yeah yeah it, right, it right. really is you know and it's just really so you would school. are you a, a, a David Lee Roth or Sammy Hagar <laughs> I think by default David Lee Roth but I think I'm more of a Sammy. Sammy's the guy, man. I know. He's, I, yeah. I like Cabo too. You know? Yeah, Cabo Wabo, baby. <laughs> so, so what happens? So you got a, you're, you're pursuing this 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 degree to, to go with percussion or drum. I don't even know what the degree is called. Um, yeah. So just music education. So was, music education, yeah. and uh, so what, you want to fill me in on kind of how you jumped into the whole field? <laughs> yeah. So North Texas music education. So yeah, from you know. Did you have any experience in the field before? No, zero. And nor did I have any family members. Yeah, in it. You know, because everybody has that. Like you go on a rig today, and man, especially on like the field level, it's these guys grew up together. Yeah. You know? well, I grew up with the tool pusher, yeah. you know, or or something like that, right? So, or somebody's dad was you know a company man or, or something. Like There's a lot more those, those stories yeah. than not. Yeah. I think. So how did you, so so t so walk me through this. So uh, for better or worse, I jumped out of North Texas. I moved back to Corpus. Uh, I worked for just a few just like cons, uh, appliances, and just like oh, yeah. so just I just needed a job at that point because okay. right? I had no skill set. Uh, I worked for this direct sales and marketing company selling Verizon FiOS door to door in Dallas, which actually gave me like a ton of. Uh, insight and, and knowledge on just kind of the commercial side of a business and what I'm responsible for now professionally. And uh, I think to those days all the time. Uh, and then uh, I was working uh, as a salad and nachos cook at Chili's in, or I started uh, New Year's on 2000, yeah, New Year's Day 2011. And I only worked there for like three months. and. I remember Corpus had been acclaimed to be the fattest city in America. I remember that. And I was at church. It was like the craziest thing. I, and I'm not like this crazy church guy, but I just, I loved, it was Bay Area Fellowship. Shout out to those guys. Uh, and I really liked the sermons because the pastor would always relate it to professional business and stuff. It was like the coolest, oh, coolest. I thought relate to like chilies or like <laughs> skill of case or the If you want the old timer with cheese, yeah. this is where you can yeah. Go for the heathen <laughs> and go for the awesome blossom. <laughs> blue onion, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so Corpus was acclaimed to be the fattest city, and he said, you know, we need to take care of ourselves as just a society, yeah. as a town, as a community, uh, to tell you guys or to show you guys that it can be done. I'm going to give the entire church service on an elliptical machine. And so he did that. He did three full services. We showed up, you know, to the uh, middle or second wow. one, something like that. And so it was really, really cool, and a lot of people, you know, were, were pretty hyped about it yeah. and stuff like that. And so uh, he said, look, there is a list uh, outside in the lobby of gyms that if you tell them they have a fellowship, uh, you know, sent you there, yeah. that will give you two weeks for free. And so that was really cool in itself, and, you know, obviously the crowd went ballistic. And it was just a really cool deal to experience, uh, you know, going there. And then at the very end, he said, look, none of this would have happened. None of this would happen if we didn't ask. And sometimes in life, if you want something, you need to ask for it. And so, fast forward a few hours, I'm at my uncle's house, my mom's brother, and his neighbor from across the street, uh, who worked with a company called M.I. Swaco, mm -hmm. uh, just was over and I asked, like, hey, it was crazy. I was like, this is, this is the time. You guys hiring? Said, did you uh, have any idea what he did? Zero. Or you just like, for a job? like zero. I had zero okay. knowledge of that. I, mean, I just dove. Stumble upon. Yeah, I need a job, yeah. man. Um, and he said, "Yeah, we, we just got authorization to hire like five to eight guys. If you want to, you know, give me a resume or you know, go go by the office, come see me. You know, right. maybe next week or whatever the case was." So I showed up, gave him a resume. In which I thought would never give me a job right, right there. And at the time, uh, South Texas and Eagleford was on this crazy uprise. Right? I, mean, at the, I think at that time it had you know, 100 and something rigs. And it was on a big uprise as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so uh, they just needed guys just to run solids control yeah. on our rigs. And so I, I got a job. You know? And uh, within two weeks, I rolled over to HMP 314, uh, working for Anadarko. 
I was told, as you know, all these guys probably were at the time, hey, it's going to be you know, a week or two. I ended up over there with an average of around four to five days off a month for 363 days. God. So, okay. That was wild. So you go, you're going from, you going from uh, Chili's, you're going to church, you're going there, <laughs> and then suddenly right now you, you, you're plunged into to the, to Eagle Fur when it's turn and burn, right? You're blown, you're going, it's, it's there. How did you feel, I guess, the, I guess the, your first couple days, a couple of weeks in the oil field, in this new environment, uh, around these, this new equipment, these new terms that you don't know, and around just all these, this, this different group, you know what I mean? Because yeah. we are a different breed, you know what I mean? It's, Definitely. Which we discussed before we started in the podcast. Um, and uh, so what was your, re when we say difference, good thing, like we're very blessed to be in this industry. So what was your kind of feeling, I guess, stepping on and being like, holy shit, like, what, what, like, what was going on in your mind? So it's, so it's one thing, I think for me and a lot of people, to be the new guy at school, you know, you move, it's kind of like that feeling of, you know, you, you listen more than you talk, right. and then you're with a lot of raw people, uh, you know, a lot of different personalities, very, very, funny. Uh, very funny, very hard, very crazy, very all of that, and I remember my <clears throat> first few times on a rig, it was a night call, I don't even remember the rig, but I remember thinking, this is like a big, big video game and it's super loud and this is wild like this is what I guess this is what it is yeah you know, this is a drilling rig and um, they had overpacked the centrifuge or something like that and called us out there so I had to get a pressure washer and just get blasted with just oil you know yeah. just like hey, welcome to the oil field you know that, that's just what it is and I was in training at the time and stuff like it's that. It's kind of fun doing that, like actually like bust your ass and like kind of getting dirty like that. You know, I, it was I, cool. Yeah, it is. I mean, looking back on it, it was really, really, really awesome. Yeah. You know, and it, I mean, there's only one way to be introduced on the field level in oil and gas like that. You know, yeah. it's very raw and very in your face. Uh, and then, yeah, I was, I was with that organization. The funniest part is that I was with that organization, just rolled into it. Turns out... My cousin, uh, who are dads or brothers, he had been involved with a neighboring competitor of MI Swaco since like 1995. <laughs> and that's the only person that I knew of in my entire family that was in oil and, and gas. And you found that out after getting a job from your neighbor. Yeah, exactly. And so he's like, hey, uh, yeah, you're with MI Swaco. I'm with this company called Derek. And, and so, you know, we would send pictures of just a piece of equipment, a centrifuge, or just something, right? He, it was pretty cool. And then. Was it kind of like a. Like a Fun robbery, like, for sure. Yeah, well, yeah. I, yeah, and looking back on it, it's like totally just kind of overplay, like to overplay me, right? Just say, hey, we're we're uh, processing at you know 100 gallons a minute, and then he sent me a picture of you know this Derek centrifuge processing in you know 150. Yeah, you know, and just say, oh, by the way, it's like 20 percent torque too, or whatever the case, oh, you know. Sorry, like, wrong, sorry, old, wrong thread. Old, older cousin, I'll yeah. never be as cool as him, you know. Yeah. So uh, it was it was really really interesting in that respect of just. Having a, a common bond yeah. with this guy, who I really hadn't spent, he's much older than I am, and I, I, it's not like I grew up with him and stuff like that. So it really created this cool bond, and he was from Houston, you know, just energy sector of the world, corporate, you know, and I was just from you know, Corpus Christi field yeah. office. So um, it, it, was, it was cool. So how, did, so how did you get brought over to um, uh, Derek? Uh, I, I'm assuming it's through your cousin, I don't know. I'm assuming it's through your cousin, and then... Tell me about how you kind of got into your role uh, today. Yeah, so November of 12, so fast forward, like when I started with MI Swaco, this was about a you know, year and a half, a little over a year and a half later. Yeah. You just said, hey, there's an opening for a service position uh, out of the Corpus Christi office. You should, should, you should apply. Okay. I remember texting him, uh, you sure, I should, you sure? And he said, yeah, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. Okay. I was just, and I trusted him, you know, I just did. And so I, once again, like, just sent him my resume, and, uh, shoot, it was five interviews, and 90 days later, I'm a Derek employee. All right. You know, and that was February of, uh, February 13. And, yeah, I was, a, that's the crazy thing, too, because we had a, a ton of rigs, you know, in that area. I was one guy responsible for, like 60 and rigs. so what was your, what was your role? Uh, service tech at that service time. Service tech, yep, okay. Yep, so, and 
of a lot of capital equipment acquisition. There was new iron. I mean, there's just a ton of equipment to manage. And I think, I think the whole country was kind of, well, definitely South Texas was just kind of going all over the place. Um, not enough manpower, oh, not enough equipment, right? Like, yeah. not, it was just wild at that time. And I really didn't realize that. I mean, you know, when you, when I woke up at that time, it was, Hey, I need to go to X rig or Y rig or Z rig and just, replace this, inspect this, and, and that was it. But I had no clue about how it was five years prior, you know, or 10 years prior, and, and how busy that that was. So you jumped into it literally during the wave. Yes, so it was right, like I mean, on it. Running, oh, right? yeah. 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 And the cool thing is that I had had, you know, experience running that equipment, so training on the, the differences of, how to replace it's just a, a different piece of technology and different parts to replace and stuff like that so the main idea was there with you know in this case uh, shell shakers and so it's just hey what what size wrenches do i need for these bolts yeah. and, and stuff like that you know obviously there's a, a ton more to it but at the time it was very very um, just hey wake up and just make sure equipment's running you know yeah. if you get a call you know kind of do this do that i, I it, it was just it was wild at that time, you know. So, so you, so you've been in. So this was in 2013. Correct. 2013, this happened, and so that you've been with Dare Corporation for seven years. Uh, seven and a half years. Seven and a half years. Yeah. And that's pretty impressive. I mean, I think there's a uh, very, very few times that <clears throat> not very few. It's becoming more normal for people to uh, be in positions anywhere from you know, three to five years. You know, then, then move, then move, then move. And especially on the service side, you see that a lot more, I feel like. And this is just me, my opinion, so I don't know any facts to back this up. But I feel like on the service side, you see people move companies a lot more. How, how, what has kept you at Derek for seven years? And so I remember, uh, so, I mean, first and foremost, and everybody at, and that was, and that was a knock towards Derek. I'm just saying you've been in a company for a long time. What, what's kept you at this one company for this long? Yeah, so, I mean, everybody at Derek is going to laugh at this because we say it all the time. I mean, even what? you know, Mitch, our CEO, has said this forever, and he, he always just hypes on uh, not over saying this, but he says it's about the culture. And it really is. I, it's just one of those places. It's, a, it's not a conglomerate, right? I think everybody should work for a huge, huge company, as I did with you know, Slumberjay, right? And my Swaco is over 100,000 mm -hmm. employees, right? Going from that down to you know 600 and that's still a ton of employees as well but you know even like in our, our Houston office there was under 100 so um, and obviously I started out of Corpus with at the time there were you know, four so I went from a hundred guys locally out of Corpus to three or four guys yeah and so um, but some people thrive cool. in, some people thrive in those bigger companies and some people don't you know what I mean you know that uh, I've been in talks with a lot of people. They say, "Hey, well, what about like career progression? Yeah. Room to grow. What if you want to transfer from one business line to another? Or, you know." And I remember seeing stuff like that. Like, do you want to go uh, um, pursue Pathfinder? You know, for, or something, whatever the case was, right yeah. within within that organization. Organization, and I just loved the feel. It, it really had just like a, this real uh, organic, really like not crazy corporately. Uh, influence, you know, it's still rotten now. Like Derek is extremely corporate, yeah. but it's there's a very, very big sense of just uh, personal passion within every employee, and and you know, you, you have a lot of impact. I think that's another thing too, right? People feel that they're more impactful within a smaller organization in right. general. And another thing is, uh, I remember people asking me. You know, I, I felt like for the first time that managers were pulling me up instead of maybe just kind of, you know, relying you, on you can't play fake. information yeah, like, to report to their supervisors. Yeah, because, I mean, you have 100 guys, and all of a sudden it's some, some of them is perceived as, like, playing favorites or something like that. Yeah. Right? So, and I, I get that. I, I think that's maybe just the, the nature of a bigger organization, especially with just a bunch of dudes, you know. Yeah. And, and it was really, really cool. And um, I remember you know, my first manager said, look, I know you're going to be all over the road. There's just one or two things. One, like you, or I think, yeah, it was just one thing. Like just answer your phone. Yeah. And I understood that after about a week of being there. It's because, man, I just, we, were, we just had so much 
just activity at the time, I mean, yeah, you would get a call at 10 p.m. or you and, and you just needed to do that. So I, I never, I didn't ever not do that. Yeah. You know, I always answer my phone. And there's a, you know, as I've kind of progressed, I always answer my phone, and it, it's just kind of something that I started doing. So what do you like about? I guess so. So you you've gone from uh, the I guess the the what is it the I had it up here the, the service side and then now you're the U.S. account manager. Yep, correct. One of the two. One of the two. Shout was, out Chance Van Beasley. Chance Van, I'm sure he's a avid listener of Round the Rotary. <laughs> um, so tell me about that. Tell me about that transition from going from a, uh, a, a the Shaker Stream optim, optimization manager to a U.S. account manager. So and how's that been for you? Because you you adjusted kind of in the middle of the uh, the, the the quarantine pandemic uh, around summertime June, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Tell me about that. Yep. So uh, so yeah, I, I think it's been four or five positions I've had in, in my time with the Derrick organization. Started in service, South Texas. At the time we were doing some stuff, uh, testing some centrifuges out in North Texas. Since I had had experience running that equipment, they asked me if I wanted to uh, jump on this project where we were pro- uh, processing all the fluids and cuttings, all of that. Uh, directly from the flow line into two centrifuges, which is it's just a pretty wild process. So uh, I said, yeah, where's it at? They said, uh, Denton, Texas. All right. University of North Texas. I was like, oh, we'll yeah, yeah, right. no, no problem. And so I was on that project for around six months or so, and I, I was obviously not in South Texas anymore, so they kind of farmed me out to the Houston office uh, as a resource, and after that time, uh, you know, who would be my immediate manager in tech service asked if I would like to be a part of the Houston office. So I actually only worked out of the South Texas office uh, running service with that group for I think under like seven weeks. Well, no, well, I, I, think what, I think what I'm asking you is like you went to U.S. account manager uh, in June um, from, the, from your previous role, right? Yeah. Yeah, so tell me about that, I guess, uh, taking on a new role, new uh, challenges and responsibilities, right? Three months into this uh, quarantine. Oh yeah. Pandemic. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Let's fast forward. Fire. Yeah. So it was more like a like a technical sales role, and so did you ever do sales before? Well, not with this organization, door to door. But which I, actually, <laughs> you know what? Honestly, I'll bet you learn about how to handle honestly rejection. I, there, I, which kind of you grow callous, which is a great trait to have as a salesperson. I I can go into any company man's office. With, with any adversity today, and 95% of the ability comes from knocking on doors and being told no. <laughs> in the middle of snow in Lincoln, Nebraska, trying to sell them Windstream. I, I promise that. Yeah, so uh, so I was in tech service, right. and a lot of it was uh, in exactly what we talked about, you know, kind of supporting the product, and you know, whenever you have, uh, I don't know, some sort of like screen consumption issue, and, and you need to figure it out. Is it, is it a mechanical issue? Is it drilling fluids that are negative in, impacting you know, screen life or whatever the case is? I went from that to going over the commercial side and helping push commercially uh, business by using these uh, technical uh, skills, right? Okay. Just these te- this technical service. And so it just kind of made sense for me to kind of help on that piece. So I wasn't an account manager, but I very much pushed commercial efforts directly with the operator okay. and things like that. And before it was just like, hey man, we got this issue. Can you come up or can you go up to uh, the Bakken or Marcellus or Utica or something like that and kind of park and camp and figure out what's up to, hey, we, we've been on kind of the defense end. I think we can use this skill and this service to commercially push our products. And then, so then it just made sense for me to transition into the SSO, Shaker Screen Optimization Manager role. And so I just helped, I, I, my, my actual job duties never changed. But it was very much more, instead of receiving the phone call, I'm talking with these guys on the commercial side and we're, we're strategizing right. how, how to proactively push uh, you know, business with that. Well, that's service. another benefit of working at a, at a company of that size, um, I don't know if you can say that small or medium, I don't know what you want to consider that, but I mean, the fact that it's able to actually, I guess, compress roles and bend and, and oh, we, we have a new need right here, let's see how this works, versus being stuck in that bureaucratic, 
you know, red tape where it's like, nope, this is the rule. You do not yeah. cross pollinate. Definitely. I mean, they made, they made that position up for my transition over, and there was never an SSO manager before, so um, I didn't even make the name up, or, you know, I didn't get to choose the name. <laughs> they just changed it. I was like, okay, that's, yeah, that's who I am now. But, yeah, so then at that point, uh, I started really integrating on, on like, almost like on the sales side, right, but I didn't have any accounts that I was responsible for, and at the time, there were two uh, U.S. account managers, and one of them uh, transitioned to another organization, and so it was just kind of timing. And you know, he did it like two weeks before shutdown. Oh, the beginning of March. Right there. Okay. Okay. We all hung out as a small group at UFC Houston, and I think like the next week that he he had just jumped out, and then like that next week it was just like, hey, um, yeah. The, shut down and you know here, here comes COVID-19 right and so at that time we just hey let's uh, we need to split up you know his accounts between kind of the two remaining right. guys and and so it just made sense to just put me as you as account manager you know and, and then the, the in June day. of yeah. 2020 yeah and tell me about that uh it's it's been interesting I mean, you know I, I, it's not like I was responsible for accounts when oil was a hundred dollars you know? and so for me uh, I've been able to ride almost in the trenches of that on the ground level, and a lot of guys that were on the ground level too that you know, are now customers. They you know, now they're a drilling manager yeah. or you know something you like see, that. You see right? people kind of grow with you, or yeah. kind of maybe jump over here and they're doing something different. Yeah, I can, yeah, I see these all the time, and that's cool. And you never know where people's career paths will grow or where you run into people. Like we were talking about before, we were talking about a. Uh, Scott Rivera before. Yep. And then uh, you you're like, yeah, it's <laughs> funny. It's like I met that. We talked to, was that story again? You met him on the uh, location. Yeah. When you first started out. Yeah. So I was with MI Swaco, and uh, there was like this new technology that was coming out, and they were kind of field trialing yeah. it on a H and P rig. And I remember he he and uh, you know the drilling group basically just went to every single rig around the Eagleford and just kind of introduced themselves and just kind of talked to people. It was really cool to just kind of yeah listen to what he had to say and you know probably make us feel like you know we're all important because we're a part of the Anadarko development right I mean just all these things and then uh, we had you know fast forward maybe a few more minutes and he wanted to kind of talk to the people at MI Swaka that were responsible for this kind of trial so I was the guy that just kind of got to take a pause uh, you know from my washing down giant sticker screens or you know operating centrifuge and go up and just kind of be the ears of Hey, like, what do these guys talk about? You know, like, what, what is this? But that's but that's what that's what I'm talking about. The path, you know what I mean? I mean, here you are, you're you're, you're power washing something you know what <laughs> I mean, a couple of years ago, you know, and now suddenly it's you know throughout both of y'all's career. Now you're, here you are again, and, and you're kind of you know y'all are talking on it because he's I guess whatever. But the point is like people's careers always kind of meander, kind of go in and out, in and out, and it's funny how you always like tag where you can tag up with people that you knew in your past. They were in a completely different role as you were as well. You know, I, I think it's cool about our industry. Yeah, you know, it's always changing, but it's like we're still always going to be in the same house. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, there's there's people, you know, customers or not. That I, I got like a random text message. Hey, I'm with so and so who worked for Derek, and er, it was like somewhere in the Marcellus or something like that. Said, hey, remember me? I was the, you know, Derek man on Patterson, whatever. Yeah. Right. And I just thought this is. And, you know, hey, so, yeah, where are you at now, right? And he's, like, in a different part of the country and a different rig and all this just, you know, across the, across the U.S., right? And I love that. I love that about our industry that it's, you know, you always hear this, man, it's a tight-knit group, and it's very small. It's very big, but it's very small, and it's extremely true that, that it is. So I guess going from a, uh, an opt a, a opt optimization manager to a, a U.S. account manager, I mean, so how has that been for you, I guess, personally, I guess, getting to back in, I guess, into, not getting back, yeah, getting back in the sales role a little bit? So, for me, um, I just was a guy that wanted to do that technical analysis myself, right? And, and so I, the a big piece was kind of stepping away and, hey, you know, that call tech service to help out with that. You know, that that's a tech service effort now. Yeah. And you can, obviously, it, help that but now it's like that's them 
it, and for me, I think, what are you talking about? That's me. But it's not me, right? I got, you know, I'm responsible for a, a ton of different accounts and, and need to go that way now. Um, and I'll tell you, the job is, it's, it's like probably the hardest, but it's the easiest as far as, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just kind of speaking blindly, but there's less accounts to manage, I think is my point. Right? Right. So there's just less people to coordinate discussions with, right. you know, and stuff like that. I almost have to write myself notes. Hey, we talked about this rig with this guy, and they're going to be adding two more rigs in February. So you have a personal right? CRM for yeah. yourself. Yeah, for sure. And we have a great, you know, we use Dynamics for all that stuff, and, and it's cool. But even just kind of on my personal log, you know, I could hardly imagine what it would be for an account manager back in, like, 13, 14. Oh, God. You know what I mean? Like, how many operators were there back then, right? Oh, how many rigs? How many people you know? do you know? Who to know or how many people know or, or what the role? Yeah, was, yeah. yeah, that was, I guess that was pretty, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely slowed down a little bit. Uh, lately. So so tell me about this. So I guess going on, we're, we're it's Q4 2020 right now. Um, shit sucks. Um, it's pretty bad right now. <laughs> so where do you focus on at, uh, I guess, Dairy Corporation? If you, if you can speak to this on kind of, uh, is it what, what is it? Is it is it some, some new technology or something that y'all are focused on, or that or that uh, you'd like to speak about, or something like that right now? That, sure. That's that you're looking forward to getting this out to location in Q1, Q2, Q3. Definitely. So, so there's I think two parts for that. So one, we have uh, an existing product line that was it came in.